Testing. Hello. Up next, we have Eleanor Saita, who's going to tell us how to subvert modern urban power structures. All right, I guess we're uh, starting with a pretty small crowd today. Let's see if more people filter in. Um, anyway, I'm going to talk about what people, what individuals can do to and for the cities that they live in um, in a pretty direct way. So we're an urban species. As of the middle of last year, or middle of 2008, uh, more than half of all people live in cities, um, which is kind of interesting, really. Um, cities are power structures. They are huge conglomerations of wealth. They um, embed themselves and reproduce the socioeconomic hierarchies of the societies that create them and that they comprise. A city controls what we can do and tells us what to desire and tells us what actions we can and cannot take in interesting ways. The postmodern city of modern capitalism changes us a lot of the times in ways that we don't like. We can find a lot of really good things in cities, but we can, you know, community, culture, uh, friends, resources, all of that kind of stuff. But we also f can see this sort of um, totalizing scheme of consumption that you know, you're driven to consume and buy and that kind of thing. Um, and social alienation, this sort of an hyper-normativity and disengagement from the people around you, which you know, maybe aren't things that we necessarily want in our lives. As individual citizens and residents of cities, we often think of ourselves as not really having that much control over the environments that we exist in. Cities, as reproductions of power structures, are often kind of hostile to the ways that we might want to change them. But within the hacker culture, we know how to change systems, and cities are basically systems. So there's no reason why we should be disempowered in that kind of way. This talk is intended for people who, you know, whether or not they're members of the hacker culture, are interested in improving the places where they live in a pretty direct way. We're going to look at a set of ways to understand how the changes that you make can affect the city that you live in. We're going to look at the kinds of um, power structures and the external forces that change the shape of cities. And we're going to then look at how we might react to those power structures and actually act on those cities, followed up by a bunch of examples of ways that people are doing this kind of work right now. Uh, given the nature of cities as embodiments of power structures, it should be pretty obvious that you can't really have an apolitical urbanism. The left and the right view these sort of power structures in very different ways. And the tools that we use to understand cities, um, sociology, history, geography, economics, are all not neutral. They all have inherently political viewpoints. So this talk, therefore, obviously comes with a kind of a specific political understanding. As we explore the city and our responses to it, we're interested in quality of life for all citizens in that city, not just for you know, some specific class or category or that kind of thing. And we're interested in a specific kind of quality of life um, we're not talking about this kind of traditional efficiency-based urban planning, but a more human quality of life. Um, you know, is the city alive? And not, you know, do the people enjoy it? And not in like the sort of shallow, consumptive Dubai hedonism kind of way, but in, you know, in the, the deeper way, the sort of quiet pleasure of time well lived. These are the kinds of questions which we can find interesting, but they're in a lot of ways directly opposed to the mindset of urban planning based on the maximization of extracted value and the efficient conduction of business. Um, this puts us kind of necessarily in opposition to a lot of the core processes of capitalism. Um, acting as individuals instead of through commercially entrenched governance also takes a political stand. Traditional civic engagement is useful and interesting and important but we're kind of looking to poke cities in the ribs and make them squawk and see what happens. So architects and urban planners have a bunch of different systems that they use to represent how they see cities. These traditional constructings tend to provide a kind of inhuman view of space. They're not intended to measure the kinds of structures and capabilities that we're interested in here. 
So, um, you know, they, they need theoretically objective tools that they can use as statistical measures of what's going on in cities, and that's great, but that's not what we want. So we're going to look at a few different schema which are more useful and more appropriate concepts for examining how we can interact with the world around us and how specific interventions can change those interactions. Um, if we have to or if we want to intervene in a city, we need to understand what our intervention is going to do, whether or not it's going to change the city in a positive way. And these tools can help give us that understanding. So the city that you live in is not the same as the concrete factual city, if there is such a thing. It's not the city that's outlined on the map, which is also not the real city. Um, you deal with some small corner of the city, and so does everyone else. Um, in New York, you know, I have the apartment that I live in, I have the coffee shops that I work in, the hacker space that I go make things at, the office that I spend time in, that kind of stuff. That's one facet of the city, and everyone else has a slightly different facet of the city. Um, and they miss just as many facets as I do. The significance that I attribute to spaces and the affect and their meaning is not the same as the significance and affect for anyone else. We may walk down the same physical streets, but that doesn't necessarily mean that they mean the same things to people. Um, this kind of difference extends further into the literal structure of cities from a geographic perspective. When people navigate, they think in terms of points and you know, nodes and paths and regions. And those are all socially constructed entities. So I can say that, oh, you know, I'm walking down this street and I'm going past the bank and I'm going past the coffee shop and somebody else walks down the same physical street and they pick out a different set of landmarks. They walk down past the drugstore and you know, the corner bodega or whatever. Um, so while we're walking down the same physical street, we see these as different places. You know, I have in my head, oh yeah, this street connects to that street and somebody else remembers a different set of street connections. And for me, that other path might as well not exist because when I'm planning how I walk through the city, I don't see that path. So our cities can literally have completely different shapes, which is kind of interesting because that's a purely cultural process to generate those constructions of how people understand the city. There's a concept called an imaginary, which is some culture, some subgroups understanding of what the city is. And an imaginary in a lot of ways is a city. Um, it's a culturally produced object that is shared it's produced when people have experiences in the city and talk about them to each other, you know, to other people. Um, cities are produced not just by, you know, concrete and not just by the experience of living, but by music and writing and movies and conversation and all of these kinds of shared things that build up this sort of unified imaginary of what some group of people think about the place where they live. And in a lot of ways, that imaginary is as real or more real than the actual city. So if you change that imaginary, that understanding of the city, you can change the actual real city without ever changing a single brick, which is kind of interesting from our perspective as individuals wanting to change cities. The notion of an affordance is a concept from industrial design, and it's how the properties of an object change how you can use it and how you think about using it. Um, the classical example is door hardware. So different door handles change the way you think about interacting with the door. If you see a flat plate on a door, you're probably going to push on it. That door affords pushing on it. Um, if you see something like that, you're going to say, oh, that wants to turn. Like, that's the operation that it supports. So therefore, turning on it and then from the shape of the door jam, that tells you, oh, I need to pull out on this door to open it. So this is this very, you know, this is the kind of very low-level messages that objects communicate to us. Um, there's a concept of an affordance mismatch, which is when an object affords certain actions, but those aren't the actions that actually make it work. Um, so for instance, you know, this door, that kind of looks a lot like a push plate, and it's the same on both sides. So what do you do there? You don't actually know how to interact with that door until you read the sign. That sign is an, is a, an indicator that there's some affordance mismatch in this door, because you can't just interact with it without having to read a sign. Um, there's another kind of affordance mismatch, which is say, okay, well, let's say I want to shut that door and get some privacy. That's not really going to work. Um, it's a glass door. So this is a, a kind of an interesting concept, and you can apply this to the design of, of 
things larger than like the industrial object scale, you can apply it to cities. And you come up with the idea of an affordance for living. You know, how the real or perceived properties of an object affect the way you can live with it and around it in this kind of fully contextual sense. If you have a bench on a city street, it has one immediate obvious affordance, sitting on it. Um, you know, you can build a bench that's more or less comfortable, more or less durable, uses less material, et cetera. That's still kind of in the range of industrial design. To move beyond industrial design, you have to look at the way people may want to use that bench. Um, in especially beneficent cases on the street, you know, you get a bench with a shelter on it. But a lot of the time, that bench isn't actually very friendly to its users. You know, it may not be a bench that you can, you certainly probably can't lay down on it on your average city bench. You know, if you're, if you're especially unlucky, you probably can't even keep sitting on it without a certain amount of effort. Um, so this is a, a design, you know, this is a, a situation where that, that object only affords a very specific kind of interaction with it. We can expand that set of affordances and you know, look at how that changes the way people can interact with that. For instance, what if you'd like to sit on the bench in the sunshine and eat your lunch? That's not the bench that you're going to sit on. You know, that's a bench that affords sitting and waiting for a bus, and only that. And that really restricts the kind of life that you can have in the street because of that. Um, you, know, you, can, you can change this around. Let's say you make it a bench that you can sit down and lay down on. You put in a bunch of them, so it doesn't matter if somebody's laying on bench and sleeping there. Who cares? Go sit on a different bench. Um, you know, it's facing down the street, so yeah, you can still see the bus coming, but you can also like interact with the sidewalk. You don't have your back to everybody that's passing by, so you can sort of interrogate, you know, interact with that sort of life of the street. You make the, the armrests kind of thick, so you can put a lunch on them and that kind of thing and eat, and it's not a big deal. Um, and so there, this is this idea that you can enlarge the, the set of affordances that a physical object supports pretty easily. The liveness of space is our, our last kind of tool for understanding city. Um, this is a kind of complicated idea. We are concerned about the quality of experience in the cities as shaped by their built form. So we need some kind of evaluation criteria for that form. We're not looking at functional efficiency because that isn't really what we're concerned about. So we're, not, we're also not looking in terms of an aesthetic judgment. We're, looking, we're not looking for architectural style, beauty, any of that kind of stuff. So we're looking at the degree of which a space supports everyday life. And not just the kinds of life that it supports like an affordance, but simply the, the quantity of life that it supports. And from Christopher Alexander, we get this concept of the liveness of a space. Um, it's interesting that you can ask people across cultures to take a look at a single space, and they'll give you reasonably consistent ideas of between two spaces, which one feels more alive and more human. They may have vastly different ideas as far as what they want to see in that space, how they would use it, all of that kind of stuff, but they come up with the same ideas in terms of how alive it is. So you can take a look at a, look at a couple of open spaces. This is not a very living open space. Um, I guess it's a little washed out. I don't know if we can drop the lights a bit, um, but it's fine if we can. Um, Anyway, so you know, you've got this asphalt courtyard. It's surrounded by these really industrial buildings. There's kind of nothing going on there. This is not a space where you want to spend time. You know, this is something which looks a lot more pleasant. It's not that different in a lot of ways. It's not that much less empty. There were trees in the previous space. There are trees here too. There's one bench and then a lot of little subtle stuff. So this idea of changing the liveness of a space is something that isn't a big, huge change, but because it's a subtle shift, it means that small actions on the part of people can frequently affect how live a space feels like. So now that we've got some tools under our belt to understand how our actions might affect the city, we can look at the context in which we're acting. Um, we need to understand why cities take the forms that they take in order to do this. So first we'll take a look at some kind of macro scale economic pressures. And then in the next section, we'll look at their more concrete ramifications. Um, an understanding of the forces that historically shaped urban space is really useful as far as giving us this, this context. A city can be defined by the economic activity that it supports. 
the city supports this activity, the activity generates the city in kind of a loop. People congregate for a lot of reasons, but in order to live, they have to trade with one another. So that's a part of every city. Even in very, very anti-capitalist de jure policy regimes, people still trade and trade still shapes cities. You know, North Korean cities still have market sectors for the black market, and that still affects their geography. Even though, you know, yeah, trade is technically banned. Um, in modern industrial and post-industrial capitalist societies, market forces shape the city more profoundly than any other factor. Um, this purely economic understanding of the city is kind of a problem for the living human space that we want to see. And that kind of economic process can really dehumanize space. So capitalism in the city. Capitalism provides a central schema for urban life that optimizes for things that we don't necessarily want. It optimizes for the extraction of value, and it optimizes for wealth generation. You know, in this very kind of narrow, focused way, it forces all spaces to be valued for that potential. Capitalist pressure, um, pressure attempts to reduce the role of the state to only those things that support that wealth generation, that extraction of value, and then attempts to force the state to assume as much risk as possible in a way that we've seen really obviously really recently that's associated with that um, generation of wealth. The other thing that it does is it forces anyone who's trying to do something that isn't directly generating wealth to continually justify what they're doing, continually justify their existence, and kind of compete for whatever resources are left over. A lot of, that, a lot of the time, those resources may be expressed in the form of charity, whatever. And traditional economic activity is relatively unquestioned. It's still forced to be competitive, but its access to those resources isn't questioned. In geographic terms, this yields the concept of the highest and best use. There's pressure to convert land currently under use, which is seen as economically marginal, like a park or you know, some artist collective or that kind of thing, to a more profitable use, like luxury condos. There's the related concept of rent gap, which is the difference in income to the owner and the city between what's currently realized the prop by the property and what can be extracted from it. Many of the things that improve quality of life are not things which maximize value. Um, parks, affordable transport, you know, useful public transportation, social services, cultural programs. They're either an overly extreme, you know, overly expensive drain on the tax base, you know, or entirely in the category of services that municipalities shouldn't provide at all because the um, private enterprise could make more money off of providing them. The time scale that capital operates on is also kind of interesting here. Um, Enterprises attempt to maximize profit over very short life cycles, you know, quarters, maybe a few years. Enterprises operate in a way that they're willing to frequently destroy long-term resources for short-term gain. Many of the things that generate quality of life act very slowly. You know, you can't build a park in a couple of years. It might take a decade to get, like, you know, trees to grow and all this kind of stuff. You know, that, that trade-off is very interesting in the, in the context of wanting livable cities. There's another interesting thing which has happened as cities have become more global. As globalization has altered the scale at which capitalist processes operate, disconnected national markets and disconnected regional markets have all gone into competition against each other. So now, Localities, you know, cities individually are competing against each other across the globe. And this means that one single city can't simply say, oh, I think we should have a lot of parks here. And the people in the city think that we should have a lot of parks there. And they've gathered up enough votes or whatever to overrule whatever corporate interests. Now all of a sudden there's this outside pressure coming in and saying, oh, well, these parks are going to cost, you know, these parks are going to force us to raise tax rates. And these other cities, well, they don't have parks and they don't have to pay those taxes. So that makes us less competitive, and therefore we're gonna lose business. And it forces cities to, you know, it forces this kind of, you know, searching for a lowest common denominator of social services. The end result of a capitalist economy is the concentration of wealth in an increasingly small owning class. 
this is an inescapable structural effect of the way capitalism works, especially in modern post-fortist capitalism. This causes a couple of problems, which are pretty closely related. The first is that the working class isn't necessarily so happy about this. So the state and capital have to control the working class in order to get them to keep kind of going along with this whole game, wherein they get things taken from them and given to other people. And then they have to do something with all of that money. Um, you know, you end up accumulating a whole bunch of capital. You have to do something with it, or it causes its own kind of corrosive effect of just sitting there. There are a bunch of different tactics and strategies that have been come up with for the, uh, the first problem. You have the public education system. You have mass media. There's also an interesting tactic which affects both, which is large-scale urban renewal, um, which is a way to enforce class boundaries. It's a way to break up the working class. And it's a way to provide a very effective capital sink and to kind of literally concretize those long-term economic gains. This first happened on a really large scale in Paris, starting in 1852. Um, Baron Hussman under Napoleon bulldozed, or well, had work gangs tear down much of the old medieval Parisian uh, working class neighborhoods. And they put in all of those wonderful broad avenues that Paris is so famous for, which were designed, among other things, to efficiently move troops within the cities to put down internal rebellions. And of course, all of the working class neighborhoods and all the working class slums reformed elsewhere in the city because they hadn't actually fixed any of the conditions that caused those to arise. Those people still needed somewhere to live. They had even fewer resources now that their houses had all been bulldozed. It just kind of made their position even worse. Um, and then the other thing that they did is they built housing for the bourgeoisie along all of these nice avenues, which provided this really, really visible class barrier and you know, kind of reinforcement of class status there. And a lot of work there went into regularizing the city and to the point of like um, perfecting the spacing between each tree on all of those boulevards, you know, really to a, a surprisingly deep level. None of this was accidental. Um, the language used to describe the work being done was really, really plain about its intentions. This got repeated by Robert Moses in um, New York City in the uh, mid 20th century as the, the butcher of the Bronx. In his words, when you operate on an overbuilt metropolis, you have to hack your way with a meat cleaver, which he did when he put in um, the, uh, the Bronx Thruway. So massive urban renewal projects are getting less common, uh, at least in the modern industrialized West. On the other hand, they're still happening in other parts of the world, and they're happening on a smaller scale in the West, too. If you look at the current Olympic redevelopment work in London, it's the exact same thing. You know, They have better PR now. They're not saying what they're doing is openly, but they're doing the exact same thing. The, uh, the concept of eminent domain, which is the legal tool which, has, which is used um, to do these kind of property seizures for these large scale redevelopments, has actually been getting stronger in, uh, I think it was 1997, sometime recently, um, there's a landmark case, Kilo versus the City of London, where the City of New London, Connecticut, literally seized a bunch of houses to build a completely private pharmaceutical factory, which has now been abandoned. Um, you know, this was, not, this was not seizure for public use, which is the usual justification of eminent domain. This was purely seizure for private use for a higher and better purpose. This was just seizure to improve the tax bracket. And this was held up by the Supreme Court. So another interesting thing has been the evolution of zoning laws. Um, Zoning laws are not actually that economically neutral the way, uh, the way you kind of might think they are. So this, and this is, this is an example of how the same large scale forces apply in much, much smaller, finer scales as we get down into these kind of microeconomic and concrete effects. The changes in transit technology at the end of the 19th century and the early 20th century profoundly reshaped American cities and cities all over the West. Um, before the transit revolution, if you had the means to live close to where you worked, you did so because you didn't want a long walk to work. And people did walk to work. As first electric trams and then cars and especially motor buses appeared, the better off moved outside of the urban core. You know, they, they gave themselves some room, they gave themselves some privacy. And this process continued throughout the 20th century, especially after the Second World War. Zoning laws first appeared in the 1870s in Germany. Um, showed up in the US in 1910, 
and were very, very widespread across the US by the 20s. At first, they were used as a tool to control like noxious industries, tanneries, that kind of stuff, from building too near residential areas, which was you know, generally an agreeable goal. As new building technologies allowed people to build much higher and that kind of thing, they started being used to regulate how, build, you know, how building was used, not just the use of those buildings. And as new transit technologies came in, they were also used to shape the city and kind of compartmentalize activities. This is where you started getting the first idea of residential districts versus you know, the places where people worked. You know, the industrial districts had been around for a long time. So there had previously been a set of nuisance laws which were used, but the nuisance laws started breaking down with the car because the nuisance laws were designed to deal with things which were actually nuisances. And what zoning laws were doing, among other things, was controlling social class and where people of different social classes live. So you end up with suburban areas where you can only live if you have a private automobile, not somewhere where you can live. You know, they um, kind of gating off the effects between the areas that were serviced by the, the public transit lines and the tram lines and that kind of thing and the motor buses and the areas, you know, and the richer areas. So this really introduced a whole new kind of class segregation to American cities that really wasn't there before. One of the other interesting effects of zoning laws and one of the primary drivers of their popularity from the developers as much as the landowners was the use of zoning laws to maintain the value of housing investments over time. As developers built these new suburbs, they were trying to convince people to put almost all of their income into a single undiversified investment. And so they had to prove to people that, hey, this is still gonna be worth something in 40 years. So they created zoning laws to say, no, the poor people won't ever be able to move into this town. And like that street isn't zoned for a transit line, so there'll never be a transit right of way put down that street so you know that your house is still gonna be worth something because the riffraff won't come in on the tram. This split between actions in support of the public good and actions in support of class and capital values defines a lot of the history of zoning laws. It's occasionally been a tool of the progressive left and has been used in support of integration and that kind of thing, but it's much more frequently been a right-wing tool of socioeconomic control. Um, nuisance laws were really sufficient for most of what the progressive left cared about for zoning laws. Specific tools for class segregation and zoning have included things like minimum lot sizes and minimum house sizes, so that no, you can't build less than a 3,000 square foot house on this lot, so you can't build cheap houses here. Um, prohibitions against multifamily residences, even if they're following like the same typology of the rest of the neighborhood. Um, land use patterns which require car ownership and eventually like per person car ownership where you can't just simply have a family car, everyone has to have a car. Um, prohibition on live work land use, even where commercial use isn't gonna be disruptive, like you know, a little corner store is not disruptive in the middle of a commercial neighborhood. This is very different from like a big office, which is bringing a whole bunch of people in. Another thing which is kind of interesting is that zoning districts operate along the lines with all of the other administrative districts. So you have zoning districts and school districts lined up. And as schools became desegregated, zoning law was a way to keep them artificially segregated. So if you have a zoning region which says that no, in the region of the school district, you can only build these very expensive houses, and that lines up with the school district, well, gee, you know, assuming that you still have racial divides which largely mirror class divides, you're gonna end up with a very racially divided school district. You know, pretty, pretty obviously, but you never have to explicitly segregate that school. And yeah, there may end up being one or two people who are kind of crossing that line, but you can, you can enforce that line socially pretty easily at that point. As recently as 2006 in the US, the state has actually forced families with unmarried partners out of houses they own for violating zoning laws against multiple adults sharing a residence. So this kind of thing isn't just historical, it's still happening today pretty actively. Um, I think it, it's kind of all over the map. Um, I mean, in general, towns that have more money are more likely to use zoning laws as a weapon. Um, one of the other things which is happening is that as 
um, progressive organizations are challenging this kind of class discrimination through, through zoning, you're now getting things like um, growth management regulations where they basically say, well, fine, if we can't have the zoning laws the way we want them to be, nobody can build anything new. And the environmental left has actually been pretty complicit in a lot of this because, yeah, okay, so we don't want new construction because, you know, we don't want new suburbs being built because that's not really that great for the environment. But we're actually sometimes acting, you know, in concert with those class restrictive zoning laws there. Where zoning laws haven't been effective enough, you're now getting um, homeowners associations founded by the initial developers, again, as a way of, you know, communicating to all the new landowners that, yeah, your investment is safe, you know, we can guarantee a much higher degree of conformity. Like, no, no, nobody can paint their house pink here. That's not allowed. Um, you know, the kind of thing you could never get pushed through a zoning law, but they found, you know, other ways in as, as the uh, zoning laws proved to be insufficient tools. So when you have legal structures which are intended to mirror and support class and social structures, one of the things that you frequently get are um, exceptions and a process of like, oh, oh yeah, you have, a, you have enough money, you're somebody we like in some way or another, so therefore we're going to kind of you know, let you get by this rule. And that, thing is, that um, concept is built into zoning laws. There's the concept of variance. So planning boards will simply say, oh, if you either you know, convince enough of your neighbors or in urban areas a lot of the time, if you provide some set of, of incentives. So if, if, you, if you build some public space, we'll let you build a taller building. So now you get all of these skyscrapers which have these public space plazas in front of them. And it's interesting if you take a look at those plazas as you know, from our perspective of living in dead space, these are not living spaces most of the time. You, know, you get the skyscraper and in front of it, it has a quarter acre of completely bare cement and there's a bunch of private security guys standing around and video cameras and signs telling you, you know, what you can and can't do in this sort of private space. You know, this is not space that's friendly and this is not space that the developer wants anyone to actually use. If they wanted people to use this space, they would have put facilities into that space to make it hospitable. Um, sometimes you do get places where the developers have put all of those kinds of facilities in and made it really nice. And then they'll design the space so it's like, okay, yeah, it's technically public. And if you know that you need to like take this specific elevator up to the eighth floor and then there's this nice like, you know, terrace garden up there, that, yeah, it's public space, you're welcome to come use it. But it's designed to look like private space so that unless you know it's there, you won't use it. And thus it kind of keeps the, the riffraff off the streets out of that sort of space and preserves it for the use of the tenants. Gentrification has been one of the primary drivers of social change in urban, in urban cores in America for at least the past 50 years. After World War II, capital in America, and to a lesser degree in other Western countries, shifted from the cities out to the suburbs. The urban core was suffering due to neglect from the Depression and from the war, and a lot of the housing stock was in really bad shape. In the US, the GI Bill allowed vets returning from the war to buy in and you know, get their own houses and that kind of thing. But insurance companies that considered urban housing stock to be relatively risky as an investment frequently wouldn't underwrite policies for houses in the city. Um, the urban cores were also still designed around the streetcar, and it was hard to change those around to accommodate the whole new love affair with the automobile. Um, they still are designed around streetcars. And so this really accelerated this trend that had been started by zoning laws and that kind of thing of everyone moving out of the urban cores. Once all the capital and all the inhabitants who didn't have any other choice were outside of the, the, uh, the downtown cores, then all of those urban centers became exactly as undesirable as they'd been made out to be. In the 50s and the 60s, you ended up with a counterculture movement moving into this vacuum. In the cities, they found cheap space, which allowed the kind of freedom that they couldn't have in these um, suburbs, which were explicitly designed to be very um, conformist. So, you know, and okay, so they didn't have the services, they didn't have the stability, they didn't have other things, but they were, you know, they were willing to tolerate that lack in exchange for that freedom. So they found the kind of affordances, you know, for the lives they wanted to live. So sometimes they take over abandoned properties, some, but a lot of the time they did displace existing residents. Um, as new businesses moved in to serve this new clientele, 
they frequently displaced existing businesses, especially as these people started moving in in you know, larger and larger numbers. And eventually somebody said, hey, gee, that, that little downtown neighborhood, that's actually kind of a cool, a cool place. And so the next wave of people with slightly more money moves in. And you know, all of the people who the, the urban pioneers, many of whom kind of had access to outside resources, they weren't of the same social class exactly as the people who they were moving in with. They didn't mix with those circles. So they'd already kind of pushed out the first wave, then they themselves got pushed out. And this process you know, repeated and repeated and repeated. And they, you know, they move on to the next you know, underprivileged neighborhood, whatever. Um, so this example is prototypical in the US. Um, it's occurred all over the place. And this is actually a process that has been occurring for a long, long time. This is not unique with modern society. This has been happening at least since the 1700s. Um, Vienna, after the First World War, is a particularly interesting example of this sort of thing because of the city government's response. So Austria was being suddenly forced to compete on the world market, you know, see this whole kind of idea of coercive efficiency you know, after the fall of the Ottoman Empire. And they had a really tight supply of housing in Vienna. Um, in response, and um, there, was, there were very strict limits on what the larger Austrian government would let the Viennese government do. So in response, they enacted a payroll tax. And they bought a third of all property in the city. And they put up public housing. Huge, huge number of uh, public apartments. Um, they were designed not just as low-income housing. They were class integrated, you know, different sizes of apartments, all of that kind of stuff. And they were given away by a lottery in, you know, in a socially equitable manner. Um, this kind of large-scale response to gentrification, this kind of large-scale support of um, mixed-income housing is basically unthinkable in any modern city. It would never happen, um, which is kind of a problem for communities that want to resist this kind of gentrification. Because without that sort of large-scale response, you're kind of in a tough way. Um, Various tactics have been tried to oppose gentrification. Um, co common ownership of property is basically the only thing that works. If you don't own property in common, then any given individual can be coerced out of like, oh well, you know, yeah, that's a nice prop, you know, that's a nice piece of land that you ended up owning through some lottery process or something. But well, we'll give you a bunch of money for it, which you know may still be much less than the fair market value, but especially when you're dealing with low-income housing. You don't necessarily need to give people fair market value to buy them out of their property. And so you do it in this kind of piecemeal fashion. And soon enough, a neighborhood is broken up enough that the kind of cohesive core that was allowing it to survive is broken down. Um, the problem with collective ownership is that you need a lot of money to get it going. And you need a lot of money very quickly. This is one of the places where the time scale of capitalism really comes into effect. The real estate market moves really quickly. So if you suddenly realize that, oh, gee, there's like a dozen new condos going up because this, land, this neighborhood just got rezoned, yeah, good luck raising $50 million in six months to collectively buy all that property. It's not going to happen. As we look forward to increasing oil shortages and all of this kind of bubble-driven um, chronic sur suburban overbuilding um, really starting to kick in, the motion from the suburbs back into the urban core is just going to keep accelerating. Um, we've seen the suburbs become somewhat depopulated. They're really kind of no longer the cool place to live. And that's just going to drive gentrification that much faster. So we're going to end up you know, in a, an inversion of the previous state where you have an urban core, which is once again very wealthy. And anybody who doesn't have the money to be in that urban core is going to be completely marginalized out on the periphery. In Renaissance Europe, the idea of the plaza was the, the kind of the heart of the city. Um, in smaller cities, you have all of the main administrative buildings, the church, the market, all of the um, city's wealthiest homeowners, et cetera, all clustered around this one specific place. On a market day, it literally becomes the prime commercial space in the city. In larger cities, maybe you have like a few different squares but there's still this kind of idea of the plaza as being the public space and where the social life in the city exists. Um, 
they're also where culture is constructed because they're the main exchanges. They're where people meet. They're where people talk. They're where social interaction occurs and they're where ideas are contested. This idea of the public didn't really occur in Europe until the Renaissance because under the feudal structures of pre-Renaissance Europe, you didn't really have the idea of a nation. You had the idea of you know, this feudal structure with a specific person that you know, who literally embodied the nation state. You couldn't have this concept of a public until the, um, until the ruler was, literal, was no longer literally embodying that state anymore. Um, the public is in many ways a child of the bourgeoisie because the rise of the merchant class was what allowed that um, idea of the public realm, of public debate, of that kind of thing to come up as the, uh, as the merchant class got enough power that you could have meaningful public debate, meaningful exchange of ideas, and as all the power structure wasn't following this strictly feudal hierarchy, which is kind of interesting because in a lot of ways the market economy is what's undermining the public now. So any space where you can't have divergent ideas, you know, where, where the introduction of those ideas can be restricted in a blanket way, can't be considered a public, you know, cannot be considered a public space. That's what defines public space. Um, you don't necessarily have to tolerate like harassment, that kind of thing, you know, but religious proselytization, yeah, that's, that's very much part of the public. Protest, political campaigning, all of those are activities that have to exist for there to be a meaningful public sphere. Access to public spaces has been historically restricted to a pretty small segment of the population. So it's not, you know, it's not that the public space has become purely more restricted over time. Um, prior to the 19th and 20th centuries, women frequently had little or no access to public space, um, frequently even by law. Um, you know, similar lines are drawn on race, ability, um, sexuality, all sorts of other identity categories. This contestation of public space on social category lines is one of the things that distorts that public space. In modern society, public space is theoretically defined as space where no one group has any greater access. However, the kind of social enforcement of access restrictions that's come about partially through capital and partially just through other existing social pressures makes this de facto not true. Um, many restrictions on the use of public space are only really enforced depending on the social group membership of the offender. You know, if you see some rich white guy in a suit laying down and taking a nap on a bench in a park, yeah, the cops are probably going to leave him alone. You know, if you see a poor person of color doing the same thing, yeah, they're probably going to get hassled. So, you know, there, there are definitely questions about how public public space gets to be, but, you know, there is still this concept of equal access, which is theoretically at least enshrined in law today. As the social center of the um, city, public spaces were really desirable frontage for retailers, especially those areas that are frequented by the upper classes, by the people who have money. So this creates, all of a sudden, this other axis of distortion where the mechanisms of social control are brought into play to ensure the um, economic fluidity of those public spaces where you know you don't want anything going on in those public spaces. All the people who are fronting them, who may be paying for their upkeep, don't want anything going on in those public spaces that makes it harder to sell goods. In the early 17th century, you had the first private creation of public space, which wasn't really that long after the concept of the public. Um, the Earl of Bedford built Covent Garden in London. The first large, truly private spaces mimicking the social function of public spaces were built during the 19th century. Suburbanization, though, was what really drove the explosion of private spaces that mirrored the um, affect of public spaces. You know, once you got the mall and once you had the automobile so that you could say that, no, only people who can afford a car can get to the mall and are thus welcome to, to inhabit its space, that was when, you know, that was when the concept of this, this private public space really took off. Um, 
And if you just look at the structure of a suburban mall, you know, there's this moat of parking around it, enforcing that barrier. You know, if you don't have a car, you literally have to walk across this like contested space where you're not really welcome. That, you know, that space is not designed with convenient pedestrian walkways and that kind of thing. So once you have this concept of a private public space existing in suburbia, then it got brought back into the city. Um, you know, it got engineered into the urban core, and you get this entirely new basis for excluding categories of people in urban spaces. Um, since then, you've had new categories of these sort of semi-public, semi-private spaces where private entities are taking over some government functions, um, metropolitan improvement districts, that kind of thing, are spaces which, yes, they may technically still be public streets, but they're starting to blur the lines more and more. You know, you get open air shopping malls where, okay, yes, I've walked, I'm still walking down something which looks like a street. There isn't necessarily any indication that I'm not just walking on a public street, but you're not anymore. You're suddenly in very, very different legal terrain. And if you pull out a camera or a protest sign, you'll be informed of this fact very, very quickly. Advertising is further eroding this distinction between what is public space and what is private space. When you get advertising displayed on publicly owned buildings or on billboards that overlook public space, in a certain kind of way, you can no longer say that that space is public. You know, it has this commercial interest intruding into it and shaping it. So the history of architecture, in a lot of ways, can be seen as a history of social control. Whether you're looking at, you know, the first kind of megalithic structures, ancient city walls, medieval ghettos, all of that kind of thing, a lot of it can be viewed pretty productively through a lens of fear and control. Especially a lot of the elements that we've been talking about, about like zoning law and suburbanization and large scale urban planning and that kind of thing. So um, there are a couple of specific elements that merit specific consideration here. Um, the continuing increase in social fear throughout the modern period has been driven in a lot of ways and expressed architecturally um, by this rising commercial access into uh, rising commercial control of, uh, of space. Looks like I'm running a bit short on time. I think I'm actually gonna skip through this one and get on a bit to responding with the city. So looking at this picture, you end up with a pretty bleak viewpoint of what the city looks like. This is not necessarily entirely unwarranted, but it's not necessarily as one-sided as it seems either. Um, it's not a total control of life. It's not a total distortion or anything like that. And municipal governments are starting to come around to the idea of um, the importance and the quality of life and that kind of thing, even if it's fairly narrowly defined. Uh, large and small scale civic involvement remains important, but there's a lot that we can do a lot more directly. So what right do we have to act on the city? The, um, the way we can justify our invention is based intervention in the city is basically through this idea that the city affects our lives very directly. As the city affects our lives, therefore we, we must have a right to speak back to it. You know, this is a form of free speech. It's a form of this kind of fundamental right to self-determination. So from this, you get the right to the city and you get this concept of spatial justice where, um, you know, basically the application of economic and social justice as it applies to cities. Um, this talks about property rights, this talks about a lot of things along those ways, and it's fundamentally about this urban self-determination. If we're working from this basis that everyone has an equal right to the city, then we need to make sure that the work that we're doing is also founded on this kind of equality. Any intervention claims limited resources in the city. If we want to intervene in the city, we need to reach out across lines of race and sex and gender and ability and orientation. Um, we need to work with people who are not, you know, people who are othered in our space. We need to bring them into the fold and make sure that we're operating in an inclusive manner. A lot of the time, this kind of work is pretty difficult. Um, reaching outside your comfort zone isn't that easy, but you kind of have to do it if you want to intervene from this perspective. 
working in an informal manner is really, really useful. Um, Mechanisms of social control are built up around these very kind of lockstep procedural process oriented policies. If you can work from an informal perspective, you get around a lot of those. Um, you can just kind of make an end run around them. You have this concept of tactical urbanism, um, the ways that people live in order to make do inside those social structures of control. It is not something that we should take lightly because tactical urbanism has a cost. Um, you get the idea of an informal economy, which really does mean that people who don't have a choice but to operate in those informal spaces don't have a lot of the kinds of security that we take for granted in our jobs. You know, if somebody is a, as an unlicensed street vendor, they can be shut down at any time. However, they can also act in spaces where we can't. So it's important to keep in mind that informality is you know, of, of use, but of, of limited use, and of some, something, to be, something to be wary of in our inter interactions. Modern communication networks can be really useful for building these kinds of informal structures. We have our Twitter, we have our Foursquare, we have all of that kind of thing. We can organize socially in very lightweight ways. However, it's also a mistake to think that this can necessarily challenge these mechanisms of social control at too deep of a level. Um, the state has shown repeatedly that when it is actually threatened by these kinds of informal tactics, it can crack down pretty quickly. So what is an intervention? Um, if we want to intervene, we're looking at this kind of informal, intentional action that's changing some kind of space that we're inhabiting. There are limits to, to what we can do with interventions. You know, a lot of the things that we want to challenge here are fundamentally social problems. They're, you know, we're not going to be able to design our way out of poverty, but we can still possibly create a more pleasant city and create a city which will lend itself to the processes which will eventually cause that kind of long-term social change. We can't necessarily look at the actions that have been successful in other places. Just because something worked in one city and in one context doesn't mean that it will necessarily work in our context, which is why we started with the first principles and these understandings of ways to evaluate the effect of an action on a city. One of the interesting things that we can look at for ways to create space and ways to change space is thinking of space as an event. Any space has a lifespan. Um, if you have a market, if you have a building, a building is built, it's used, it's torn down. So if we want to create spaces, we can create physical changes in the city, but act in a temporary way and create these temporary spaces that still have a lasting change on the city, a lasting effect on the city. We don't need to necessarily alter the concrete city. This concept of an imaginary means that we can play with the ideas that people have about the city and change them in these very lightweight, you know, easy to alter ways. We don't need to shock people. We're not trying to like force people out of the way that they're thinking about the city. We want to engage them. You know, the idea of bringing people in, getting them to play, getting them to be emotionally involved in what we're doing. Some of the time when we're creating affordances or when we're altering the city, we don't necessarily want our alterations to be visible. While in a lot of these cases we do, um, the idea of an affordance can a lot of the time be much more useful when it's invisible. We also have this idea of a material hierarchy. Um, if you want to change the city from building you know, a new building, that's really expensive. Um, but there are a lot of cheaper, faster, easier ways to change cities. Um, you can change a city with data, literally just change the imaginary, just look at you know, telling people about new resources, getting people to communicate, getting people to think about the city differently. You can use light. Um, projected light can define a social space, can define an area very easily. You can use paint, you know, graffiti, art, all of this kind of stuff can also get people to think about cities and get people to interact with cities differently in a very lightweight way. You can use fabric, you can do these kind of deployable structures that alter cities, again, without having to actually build something. And then if you have the money, if you have the resources, you can actually build something. So I'm going to skip the examples. I don't think we really have time for them. Looks like I'm running a bit over. Um, 
If anyone has any questions, I'd be happy to take them now. So one of the things that can, where that was coming from, so if you're, um, if you're in a position to create, um, to create an event on the street and you're not going to get city permission, you're not going to get permission from, you know, from any of the various bodies that you know, you're supposed to, yeah, a lot of the time you can probably get away with that. However, if you've gone and reached outside your community and you're bringing a whole bunch of different people in, some of those people may be in a lot more trouble than the average, you know, white hipster, you know, when the police get annoyed at a flash mob. And so that's something that it is, it behooves us to be careful about when we're performing those kinds of actions. Thank you. It's a very interesting talk, but I'm afraid that's all we have time for now. All right.